Vito Genovese would be the name that would go down in history. He was born on November 21st, 1897, in the southern Italian village of Risigliano, less than 20 kilometers from the city of Naples. Growing up, Vito had a father, Francis Felice, also known as Philip Genovese, who was a low-wage worker employed at numerous construction sites in the Naples region. Nunziata was Vito's mother. Vito and Felice had two sons, Michael and Carmine, and one daughter whose name is not available. The life history of Vito Genovese is very telling of how, in the late 19th century, a group of young men born in Italy came to the United States and dominated this great criminal organization over the course of almost a century. The Italian Mafia, which they affectionately referred to as Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. The great migration from the Italian peninsula, more precisely the immigration of Italians to the U.S., whose volume dominated the history of Italy for more than 50 years in the late 19th to early 20th centuries, had already started when Genovese was born in 1897. War also came into the 19th century, and the number of immigrants increased further as a result of industrialization and overpopulation. These changes in Europe led to tens of millions of Europeans, chiefly women, crossing the Atlantic and swarming the American continent with its resources in the 1830s. At the unification of Italy, at the beginning of the 1860s, a huge outflow of people took place. In the period covered by official records from 1876 to 1900, around 5 million Italians departed the peninsula and no fewer than 8 million Italians left between 1900 and 1914. Of these, at the very least, 9 million were lost. For the most part, these people made up the Italian-American community in the United States as well as in Argentina. From 1880 to 1920, about 4 million Italians moved to the U.S., with a considerable population in cities like Pittsburgh, New York, Chicago, Providence, and others. Looking for quick riches in an America that was supremely racist toward Irish and Italians at the time was unrealistic. This hatred of foreigners arose not only because of the large number of immigrants, but also because many of them were Roman Catholics. Some of the immigrants turned to crime in hopes of making money. More often than not, it was in the style of the Southern Italian and Sicilian Mafia organizations, which appeared at the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s. Soon after, during this time, the notorious Genovese family in the New World would also become known. But that was not until Vito was 15, in 1913. Vito's childhood and the life of the Genovese family in southern Italy before migrating to the U.S. are still largely undocumented. By the time of his migration, Vito was already a school dropout, having attended only a bare minimum level of schooling at rudimentary schools up until the late 1900s, then stopping at the age of 10 or 11 years to take care of the family. In 1913, a large percentage of the Genovese family, as well as many other Italians, thought they would have a better future outside Italy. The Genovese family did not suddenly leave Italy behind. As was common among Italian immigrants, Vito departed for America on the boat Taurina in 1913. His mother did not come to the country until 1920, according to records available with the United States Department of Immigration. Whether Michael and Carmine came with Vito in 1913, or when Vito's father came, is unclear. Vito's sister is not well documented, although he mentioned her on a few occasions over the years. She may have died as a young or even infant child. Vito probably stayed with one of his father's relatives living in the Queens borough of New York City after he arrived in 1913. Vito did not initially get into much trouble with the law when he first came to the U.S. In April 1917, when Vito was 19 years old, he was taken into custody in Manhattan for carrying a revolver. He accepted the guilty plea his attorney provided. He was sentenced by the court to 60 days in jail, but since the war had just broken out due to Germany's unprovoked attacks on American ships in the Atlantic, they instead offered Genovese an opportunity to join the military, and he did, as he said he would. In 1918, he was transferred to Long Island for training purposes though he did not take part in any fighting as the war in Europe ended before he was posted to the front. Nevertheless, this did not put Genovese off in any way. 
He mostly concealed his illicit activities during the late 1910s and early 1920s and refrained from conducting them in daylight, as they were unlawful. It is believed that, despite this, Vito Genovese was involved in a prostitution ring off the Lower East Side at the time, although this was not substantiated. However, it is reported that Genovese was already being directed towards the Italian mob in New York during this period, as he was a notorious bootlegger in 1924, which was during the ban on alcoholic substances. The period between the First World War and the Second World War, in the new domestic situation in America, saw particular female figures emerging within the native female population, whose activities were not traditionally feminine. Calls for alcoholic restraint had existed in the U.S. for quite some time. This occurred in the context of more wide-ranging prohibition processes in countries such as Canada, Finland, and Norway, which banned the sale and supply of alcoholic drinks in the early decades of the last century. These countries feared that awarding citizenship to drunkards would lead them to turn up in droves and neglect their households. Prohibition in the U.S. started in January 1920, a year after the 18th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and the Volstead Act that followed. American Protestants of British origin, who were among the most active supporters of the ban, probably also favored it because they associated drinking with the immigration of the Germans, Italians, and Irish, especially since the middle of the 19th century. Their support had a more crafty, even racial angle to it. The women managed to persuade those reverends to vote for prohibition, much to their horror, as they were the Caucasians who were indulging in the most drinking, even though most politicians turned out to support the ban. Instead of achieving the goal of reducing alcohol consumption, prohibition instead fueled demand and created an underground economy consisting of speakeasies owned by opportunistic bootleggers, like the Irish and Italians, who supplied illegal whiskey. In the 1920s, men like Vito Genovese, associated with organized crime, had a variety of options for making money in the black market. Consequently, prohibition created an organized structure of syndicate-style criminal enterprises among Italian-Americans, evolving from mere ethnic pockets of street gangs. There is no denying that Genovese was involved with the Italian-American gangsters who ran the bootlegging operations in the tri-state area during the 1920s. However, it was in the latter half of the summer of 1924 that what could be called his public debut occurred. He was returning from a visit to Prospect Park when a very serious car crash took place in the middle of May. The crash occurred on the way from Coney Island to New York City. Genovese was left with several broken ribs and a dislocated shoulder after one of the other passengers in the car died. He told the New York Police Department that it was purely an accident that happened in the course of motor vehicle operations. Yet, when guns were found in the vicinity, the cops were sure that Genovese and the occupants were attacked by rival gangsters who had rammed their car at high speed. The police started writing up reports on Vito Genovese as early as 1924. Among other charges, Vito faced accusations of homicide and gun possession. In July 1926, he narrowly escaped death after being shot in the throat. What the NYPD had not yet discovered was that Genovese and other Italian mobsters, including Charles Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello, whose real name was Francesco Sicelia, were all associated with the bootlegging activities headed by Joe the Boss Masseria. They later disengaged from him when they were in their 20s or maybe 30s. In the 1920s, Genovese became part of one of the most powerful Italian-American organized crime families in New York City. Prohibition and the opportunities it created molded Genovese, Luciano, and Costello into men of great power. In fact, by the end of the 1920s, Genovese was thriving. However, it wasn't only about bootlegging. He achieved fame, or perhaps infamy, when it was reported that he had participated in a plot to counterfeit gold certificates based on U.S. dollars during a time when the country subscribed to the gold standard. For many federal officials in Washington, D.C., however, this was even more disturbing than their pirating activities on the bootleggers. This concerned the Italian mafia. In 1930, Vito Genovese was on the verge of facing this accusation in court. Yet, the case was dismissed due to the lack of sufficient evidence. 
Genovese had to deal with more than just the threat of imprisonment. One can remember the automobile crash of 1924 and the gunshot wound sustained in 1926, all pointing to the violent nature of the mafia in the 1920s. Gunshots were exchanged between Genovese and his men and their opponents. For instance, in February 1930, Genovese was indicted in the murder of one of his men, Gaetano Reina, who had switched allegiance from Masseria's crew to Salvatore Maranzano, head of the Brooklyn-based Castellamare family, who was encroaching on Masseria's territory. This was about the same period that the government was making attempts to prosecute Genovese for counterfeiting. As Reina exited his mistress's apartment in the Bronx, a double-barreled shotgun went off, fatally injuring him at close range. Genovese was long considered to be one of the two men who had been lying in wait, confronting Reina and shooting him. The contract on Reina's life, carried out in February 1930, ignited fierce and brutal gang warfare between Masseria and his lot, including Genovese, Luciano, Costello, and Maranzano and his cohorts, stretching for over a year and only dying down in April 1931. This conflict is commonly termed the Castellamare's War, after Castellamare del Golfo, a town in Sicily. Maranzi and several of his followers envisioned more or less a phantom figure, with quite a few men at the helm of the family spending time in a harbor located on an island called Sicily. The enmity went beyond New York and the tri-state area, extending to cities like Chicago, where the families involved had links to other crime syndicates, resulting in a series of retaliatory killings. By the end of 1930, Masseria's greatest forces began to fall apart. Seeing the writing on the wall, Luciano and Genovese contacted Maranzano and proposed to help him get rid of Masseria in return for Maranzano's peace and a share of New York's political influence. Maranzano agreed, and on April 15, 1931, at Napoli's restaurant in Coney Island, Masseria was shot by Luciano, Genovese, and other associates, including Ben Bugsy Siegel. Genovese had planned and ordered the internal hit on the business's former owners. This event inspired the famous scene in the first part of the Godfather film, where Luciano excused himself to the toilet, and then Genovese, Siegel, and the rest drew guns hidden beneath the table and started shooting Masseria. Masseria's death also signified the end of the Castellamarese War. However, the hit on Masseria only concluded one cycle of violence and initiated another. After the Castellamarese War was over, Maranzano organized a gathering in Wappingers Falls in New York State, attended by the majority of New York crime family bosses. He declared there that he, along with Luciano, Giuseppe Profaci, Thomas Gaudiano, and Vincent Mangano, would be in charge of all families in the Italian-American crime syndicate in New York and beyond. Long after the prohibition phase ended, the notion of the five families lingered, despite the names of the original five families transforming over the years with the arrival and departure of new crime lords. The concept of five Italian-American organizations controlling New York's underworld has remained for nearly a hundred years. However, there was not as much preference for Maranzano's other administration. On the contrary, at Wappingers Falls, Maranzano asked everyone present to pay him their respects, declaring himself capo di tutti capi, the boss of all bosses. Of course, this foolishness caused instant hatred, which Maranzano was likely aware of. That is why, in the beginning of September 1931, he asked Luciano, Genovese, and Costello to meet him in his office on Park Avenue in Manhattan. They became wary, suspecting that he might have them whacked. No, they did not wait their turn. They went into action straight away with the help of second-rate mafia hitmen. With the help of famed mafia financier Luciano, they hired thugs who shot and stabbed Maranzano to death. After winning the war, Luciano, with the help of Genovese, Costello, and others, called for a meeting in Chicago of the leaders of the mafia organizations in New York, Buffalo, Chicago, and Providence. The war's end saw Luciano again combining forces with Genovese, Costello, and others, attempting the structure that Maranzano had unsuccessfully tried to put in place months prior. Luciano called it a commission. As a result of the Five Families' idea, Luciano proposed the organization of seven bosses, the Five Families in New York, the Buffalo Mafia headed by Big Sur, and the Chicago Mafia 
in order to manage mafia activities across a wider geographical area. Luciano was offered the position of the boss of bosses. He refused, saying later that acceptance would have only fueled jealousy and made him a target like Maranzano. Instead, he would chair commission meetings as if they were meetings of equals. Luciano nominated Genovese as the second in command of the Luciano crime family since Masseria was no more after the war, and the takeover of the Masseria family enterprise was announced. Costello, at this stage, was a relative benchwarmer, but would soon show otherwise. The rivalry between Costello and Genovese would later dominate much of their lives. Meanwhile, Genovese's private life was quite chaotic in the months that followed the end of the Castellamare's War and the establishment of the Commission. Vito Genovese married for the first time in the early 1920s to a woman named Donata. They were blessed with a daughter named Nancy in 1923, but she was their only child. However, Donata died of tuberculosis on September 17, 1931, only a week after she and Luciano were scheming to kill Maranzano. All it took was an expensive funeral, which cost Vito around $30,000, and he began pursuing Anna Vernotico, a troubled married woman in her mid-twenties. Anna's husband, Gerardo, was a petty thug and bootlegger racketeer from Greenwich Village. Despite inconclusive proof, there is a streetwise observation that Genovese had Gerardo killed and his body disposed of on a Manhattan rooftop in mid-March 1932 before quickly marrying Anna. However, Gerardo's death certificate reported him as divorced, meaning he was separated from Anna before dying. Also, the Genovese family discovered Gerardo's corpse alongside one of his partners, who they had no reason to eliminate. Thus, there was no strong ground to link the Genovese family to the hit on him. Nevertheless, Genovese wed Anna shortly after, despite growing speculation that did not bear fruit. Their wedding took place much later. By the end of June 1932, Anna had delivered a son, Philip, whom it seems Donata loved, even though she was not maternal toward him. Their family would later include two more children, Philip, Marie, from Anna's previous marriage to Gerardo, and Vito's first daughter, Nancy. A legal change was about to alter the lives of Genovese and his cohorts, on top of the many upheavals in his private and criminal life in New York City in the early 1930s. The 1920s saw ten years of prohibition, which only increased crime in the country. Many legislators within the Capitol Hill area believed that the ban on alcohol consumption should be lifted. There were also economic motivations. In the backdrop of the Great Depression in the 1930s, the potential repeal of the 18th Amendment was seen as a positive step towards economic prosperity in the United States. Consequently, Prohibition was unanimously repealed in December 1933. Prohibition had been the very glue binding the Italian criminal world, later known as the organized mafia. However, with its repeal, that glue ceased to function. Genovese, Luciano, and a host of others began looking for alternative ways to make money. They did this by understanding the nexus of wholesale drug trafficking in New York City which at the time consisted mostly of synthetics brought in from China. A few years later, rumors began circulating about the same people, not call girls this time, but rather the so-called French connection. French and Italian gangsters controlled dope factories in Marseille, in southern France and Corsica, before exporting narcotics to the United States. They also began to engage in the business. Plus, the mobsters began trying to take over the in-gaming business as well. Genovese's associate, Bugsy Siegel, was at the forefront of the search for a place where the mob could establish operations involving gambling. It is not often recorded that the bright and lively free state of Galveston in Texas, where gambling flourished in the second decade of the 20th century, was the first location they attempted to do so, in the clutches of organized crime, around the 1930s when the ban on alcohol was lifted. They did not, however, create their first casino during the attack on Galveston, as activities ceased in the 1940s. It was not until the 1940s when the mob turned its attention to Vegas that it godfathered the construction of casinos there. Among the sad chapters of Genovese's life, this particular one had to do with games of chance. <laughs>
the two drug-dealing Neapolitans divided 160 grand in gambling debt from a wealthy and addicted businessman who was bribed to rig the game of cards to make it look like we have a device which does so in 1934. They also produced counterfeit banknotes. The con worked, and the owner of the store decided to bear the cost. Clearly, he was too intimidated to protest in front of several of them, many of whom were murderers. On the contrary, Ferdinand the Shadow Boccia, another enforcer under Genovese, alleged that Genovese owed him the balance of 35000 out of the 160000 paid to him for the Mark's information he had provided earlier. As a consequence of his evident unwillingness to settle the debt, Genovese had Boccia eliminated in a Brooklyn cafe in September 1934. In addition, an attempt was made on the life of William Gallo, a friend of Boccia who worked with him on several occasions in stealing, but that too had its flaws. They aimed and shot him but disregarded the horrific orders of Genovese and Miranda to cover him with petrol and set him ablaze. Afterward, a New York magistrate heard Gallo's parole version, and a new investigation against Genovese, following the murder of Boccia, was opened. For the next decade, it would become a significant part of his life and a figurative cloud that followed him wherever he went. The death of Boccia and the attempted cremation of Gallo showed Genovese's nasty character, a man ready to kill at any instance, often for foolish reasons. He was active in dozens, if not hundreds, of murders. Boccia made some of them for way less than the $35,000 he demanded in 1934. As such, he promoted the image of himself as a violent man and refused to contest his involvement in the slaying of his second wife's former spouse. Nonetheless, he was somewhat of an enigma in real life. As the years went by, many knew him as a composed, reserved individual, not at all the reckless psycho gangster like Al Capone. Although he remained composed, the calmness concealed a temperament that could draw a more aggressive response. In the end, this temper led to a series of very poor decisions. Decisions that alienated him from his former supporters, but also had deep repercussions for the entire Italian-American mafia. In the wake of the calmness after the storm that swept through Boccia's murder discussions in the mid-1930s, after several weeks, it dawned on many that the barest minimum of evidentiary basis was available to lay charges against him. In due course, they did manage to gather enough evidence to keep Luciano behind bars for the next several years. In February 1936, 200 different houses of prostitution were closed in Manhattan and Brooklyn as a police crackdown, unprecedented in scale, was executed. The name of Charles Lucky Luciano who reportedly controlled several of these establishments, surfaced in the investigation. With more than a hundred culprits, namely prostitutes and twelve managers, rounded up in a detention center, some were bound to crack. A few weeks later, Luciano was arrested and charged with paramour conduct. The court tried him, found him guilty, and sentenced him to thirty to fifty years of imprisonment. However, over the years, Many people involved from the inside said that they tricked Luciano and that he had nothing to do with the case, as there was no prostitution involved. Consequently, when Lucky was locked up in a maximum security prison located in upstate New York, and later the notorious Sing Sing prison, it was already Genovese acting as the head of Luciano's crime family. Due to his poor communication abilities, he could not engage effectively with his colleagues. Starting from the summer of 1936, Genovese took over one of the five families in all but name. To assume the position of underboss was a mammoth undertaking at that particular time. In this regard, there was Thomas E. Dewey, who had been the special prosecutor for New York and was hell-bent on seeing that organized crime would not have a stronghold in the city, particularly because the crime organization was becoming increasingly associated with Tammany Hall the political organization that had been in control of most of New York City politics since the mid-1800s. Dewey had been the man behind the efforts that led to the arrest and conviction of Luciano. Genovese tried to keep a low profile concerning the ongoing probes being conducted by Dewey. He secured a territory beyond the reach of Delaware, which was New Jersey. Dewey, however, was unrelenting, and just a few months after assuming Luciano's mantle, 
he referred to Vito as a mafia mastermind. The press turned out a lot of his pictures, something that had never happened previously. Because of what seemed like impending legal ramifications upon himself, owing to the investigation of the Boccia murder as well as other violent crimes involving Luciano family operatives, Giovanni decided to go off the grid to keep out of jail like Luciano for many decades. In February 1937, he probably set fire to his home in New Jersey so that he could claim insurance for the losses. Thereafter, he not only took Anna and himself, but also gathered three children of theirs from different marriages and left for Italy with $20 million in investment dollars and $75,000 in cash. Reports that police records show noted that Genovese was on holiday, but the man would not return for over eight years. Meanwhile, Anna came back to America with her two children and a stepdaughter, and in the next few years, Vito began receiving monthly payments in the amount of $100,000. The people of Genoa, Italy, were walking into a hornet's nest. Benito Mussolini, a.k.a. Il Duce, and the National Fascist Party declared war on the Italian Mafia and other criminal elements in the south of the country and Sicily three years after taking over the country in 1922. By then, resolute measures were, for the first time, introduced by the end of the 1920s. This decline in crime rates, of as much as 60% or more in some policed areas, should have made it difficult for Genovese to return to his motherland. However, much of this was mere window dressing. The intention of the fascist regime was to subdue the mafia, and instead of eliminating it completely, to take their cut. Genovese understood this perfectly and managed to ingratiate himself with the regime by parting with a few bucks in the late 1930s from NOLA which was not far from Naples, where he had relocated. Among other things, he spent $25,000 to make a heliotherapy center. More interesting, however, was the circumstance that Genovese was involved in arranging the killing of Carlo Tresca, a journalist to many Italian immigrants who wrote anti-fascist articles in Mussolini's New York in the early 1940s. So, he managed to foster contacts with Mussolini and his officials while running a very productive underground economy in southern Italy, most of which he monetarily benefited from. This illicit business endeavor began in the fall of 1939. At that time, there was war in almost all of Europe, and even if Italy appeared not to have joined the Second World War until the summer of 1940, the hostilities among Germany, Britain, and France involved trade disruptions, making sourcing products much harder from the beginning. The necessity to manage the supply routes across the entire continent created numerous problems. In view of such factors, illicit trade thrived and hit its all-time high during the summer of 1940, when Italy declared war on behalf of Germany. This, however, created new challenges to the supply lines in the Mediterranean, where Italy had undertaken an offensive campaign against British and free French forces in North Africa. In December 1941, the Empire of Japan, an ally of Germany and Italy, attacked, disrupting Genovese's coordination with his allies in New York. It was an attack that also brought America into the war. Realistic like all militarily astute men, he and those in America's mafia had previously struck a deal with the American government that implicated the use of their network in southern Italy and Sicily to facilitate the landing of troops in that region planned for the summer of 1943, which would open the southern front of the European theater of war. Given where he was, Genovese had every reason to be grateful for this arrangement. On July 9, 1943, the United States, Great Britain, and other Western allies launched Operation Husky, the coordinated invasion of Sicily. Having taken Sicily in slightly over one month, the war proceeded to the southern parts of Italy, with Naples captured on October 1st. By that time, the German forces had accomplished their particular mission of capturing Mussolini and keeping him as their puppet in the northern part of Italy before invading the whole country with a counteroffensive. When the Allied support lines in the south began to take shape with the anticipation of a long-drawn battle for the possession of Rome, Genovese stretched his reach, and very soon he was moving large volumes of military logistics through the underbelly of the southern peninsula. As he had the bigger share of the required licenses in his possession, he was able to divert fresh loads of vehicles filled with preserved foods, vegetables, fruits, 
sugar, flour, as well as other supplies shipped to Italy for the troops within the Allied territories. He was also in the capacity of a staff member, working as an interpreter and a bridge between the U.S. Army and the high-ranking politicians and people of significance in cities such as Naples, which was necessary for the next few months as the area would be reconstructed. In the U.S., the Genovese in New York were least developed at this time as far as activities concerning Italy were concerned. Early in 1944, law enforcement agents apprehended Ernest the Hawk Rupolo, one of five assassins who targeted and killed Federin and Boccia in 1934, this time on suspicion of gun murder connected to a different allegation. Knowing that he would serve a long prison sentence, Rupolo leaned towards the prosecutors, stating that he had information that would help in the conviction of Genovese for the murder of Boccia in 1934. The testimony given by Jerry Esposito, another state witness, corroborated his evidence. Thus, irrespective of the circumstances, if Genovese were to step foot back in New York, it was evident from the accounts of two individuals who claimed that he had contracted Boccia's killing a decade earlier that he would be charged with murder. It gets worse. He was also being investigated in Italy by a certain Orange C, a no-nonsense special agent from the Army's criminal investigation. Dickey was unyielding in her belief that Vito took part in the underhanded trade of goods and services. Although many higher-ups were hesitant to call attention to the uneasy relations between the federal government and the Italian mafia during the war, there were no such inhibitions for Dickey, and it took him months to achieve this. Finally, in August 1944, Genovese was arrested by American military police. In June 1945, eight years after the American military police had held him for arrest in Italy, Vito Genovese was legally returned to America, even before the war had ended. Boccia's murder was pinned on Genovese, but he was acquitted of the charges when Jerry Esposito was found shot in New Jersey a few months later and when no one could testify to support Rupolo's claims. After the charges against him were dropped, Genovese, along with most of his contemporaries from the 1920s, made a happy discovery of a planned meeting at the Hotel Nacional in Havana, Cuba, during Christmas 1946. The conference was planned by both Meyer Lansky and Luciano. After all, the United States government had liberated them from prison after the war for their help in thwarting the mobilization of labor in America and for their role in facilitating relationships between the American military and the Mafia in Italy in 1943. It was decided that the conference would take place in Cuba, which was close to America but outside of its jurisdiction, as they had been expelled to Italy after the war. At that point, the Mafia was active in gambling as well as other interests in Havana. The meeting held in Havana for a few days was of particular importance to Genovese in more ways than one. It was also geared toward the mob's appreciation of the future in Cuba. In due time, Genovese introduced a proposal to Luciano. Frank Costello had assumed the role of acting head of the Luciano crime family in New York, while Genovese fled to Italy in 1937. Genovese sought to get the best of Luciano by proposing that Luciano should rise again to the statutory and long-abandoned rank of boss of bosses and appoint Vito as the acting boss while Lucky was in America. Luciano did not respond well. He angrily told Genovese that he was offered the position in 1931 but turned it down and will not be taking it any time soon. Costello was not interested in this proposition anymore, nor would he allow anyone else to make him the family's acting head ever again. The struggle between Costello and Genovese for the upper hand in the relationship with the Luciano family would emerge again in a few years after this episode, despite all of Luciano's attempts to cow Genovese into surrender and keep power out of the fighting, to ensure the safety of his interests upon returning to America following the demise of the Boccia case. Vito's main task was to come back to business and stay under the radar. Throughout the remaining years of the 1940s, his presence in the newspapers was limited, only an occasional quote when the author referred to the closure of the Boccia case. Also, his business seemed not much out of the ordinary to any outsider. These included running a couple of freight enterprises based in New York and a colonial trading company on the Lower West Side which dealt in processed paper and waste rags. Although these were a good disguise, at the same time he was active in the illegal Italian lottery and bookmaking.
owned several bars, and kept houses of prostitution in the 1940s and early 1950s. To connect the dots regarding his drug trafficking operations in New York City proved to be an impossible assignment for the NYPD. Drug rackets in Chicago and other post-World War II cities had many mafia dons, but most of them avoided getting into such businesses because of the great likelihood of imprisonment for drug-related offenses. There was some involvement by Genovese and Costello, but not nearly to the extent that illicit alcohol had been for organized crime in the 1920s. Genovese gained notoriety once again in the early 1950s thanks to his wife Anna, who provided the media with unanticipated attention. Anna and Genovese had some distance in their relationship due to the long years he spent in Italy. While she was away, several gay and lesbian establishments in New York started to operate under her, and there were speculations about her being unfaithful, mostly to women. In October 1950, the New York Daily News published revelations for the first time that Anna had submitted a petition to the court requiring Vito's assistance and a support package substantially in size. She alleged that Vito had deserted her in 1948 and did not earn enough to provide for her and their young son. It was troubling that she appeared ready to furnish the courts with embarrassing details of Vito's dealings, for as she claimed, Mr. Vito owned several places in New York and even a dog track in Virginia, earning up to $30,000 a week. Such findings were presented in camera to a judge, and in 1951, Anna even agreed to make another attempt at living with Vito. However, when this also collapsed, and the matter was brought for hearing in 1953, the revelations made by Anna alarmed the friends of Genovese. It was commonplace in the life of the mob that a betrothed woman did the internal business while her husband was in charge of external dealings. However, she silenced none. In June 1953, Joseph Valachi, who never shied from killing, took out Stephen Francis, a man he had entangled to keep an eye on Anna's expenditures in Vito's absence in Italy to balance the growing power struggle in the Luciano crime family, which was caused by his wife. In the same way that tax evasion 25 years ago felled Al Capone in Chicago, so too did a conflict between Genovese and Costello concerning the running of operations after Genovese had returned to the United States in 1945, gaining momentum in the mid-1950s. Anna's alimony lawsuit, however, uncovered the opulence of Genovese as the Internal Revenue Service began conducting investigations into many other New York Mafia well-known figures, including the head of the Costello clan. Vito's and Frank's predicaments involved similar issues for many years, and eventually resulted in the arrest of Costello on charges of tax evasion in May 1954. He was sentenced to five years in jail but won an appeal that pushed the start of the sentence for two years to the summer of 1956. After Costello's jailing, there was talk about who would act as the boss until the actual boss was in place. Genovese regarded this as the time to take his place at the top of the family. Some didn't have that much confidence in him. In a few months, Costello's appeal resulted in a reduced sentence, earning him freedom in March 1957 after serving less than a year. Genovese was about to put the final nail in the coffin and make his long-standing dream of taking charge of the Luciano family a reality after Costello's arrest. At last, he did not intend to return to the conditions of the late 1950s. So, a few weeks after Costello was released from jail, Vito put out a hit on him through Vincent Chin Gigante, a former boxer and gangster in the service of Genovese, who would later become influential in the New York Mafia. One of the most famous episodes in the history of the Italian-American Mafia was the attempted murder that took place on May 2, 1957. As Costello was entering an apartment building in Manhattan, Gigante tried to shoot him in the head from a car, but missed, only grazing Costello's ear. The police suspected him following the statement of the building doorman. Costello was acquitted by the jury because of his unwillingness to give any useful evidence against the gang. Yet the episode was enough for Costello to comprehend that Genovese would never stop until he became the head of the Luciano mob family. He expressed such a decision after the attempt on his life. With Luciano banned for life and residing in Italy, and Genovese acting as the family head, he had finally positioned himself at the top of one of the famed five families. Oddly, Giangrande and Costello 
later became best of pals, and in the years that followed, the would-be killer made several trips to Costello's house. In the months that followed, Genovese took measures to consolidate his power. However, although in 1931 Luciano, who was nicknamed Lucky, refused the claimant title of a boss of bosses in organized crime among the five families, the Luciano crime family became the most powerful one at that time. As seen from their meeting in 1946 in Havana, Genovese had aspirations to become the temporary head of the family, as well as to re-establish the position of boss of all bosses. Others, like Albert Anastasia, who was also on the rise in the 1920s through Joe the Boss Masseria's faction, along with Genovese, Costello, and Luciano, apprehended his designs in this particular respect. By 1957, Anastasia was serving as the head of the Gambino crime family. Due to his propensity for violence and instability, he was referred to as the Mad Hatter and the Lord High Executioner. In October 1957, the mob boss, Genovese, ordered Anastasia's killing due to fears brought by the removal of Costello. On the 25th of October 1957, two hitmen who had been assigned to the task proved to be far more meticulous than Giangrande had been with Costello and shot Anastasia in a barber shop located on 7th Avenue after firing numerous rounds. Thus, for a sadly brief period, Genovese became the most influential mafia boss in New York City. Strangely, however, when he arrived there, it was revealed through a series of examinations that the man had an IQ of simply 84. A subsequent test returned a score of 95, again, not very high for an alleged criminal architect. On the whole, his conviction and imprisonment in the late 50s was something out of the ordinary. Schemers like Genovese never thought of anything but being betrayed, and many analysts have agreed in later years that the situation was exceptional, as there was no logical reason to believe that the head of any crime family, or even a mafia family soldier, involved in the planning of a drug business, such as the one he was convicted for, would arrange it for such an organization. Some have hypothesized that it was Luciano, who overtly disassociated himself with the creature of the 1920s, who fixed up Genovese through Italy because he was annoyed at the man for wanting to turn the Luciano crime syndicate into a Genovese one, which ultimately he did. It is a fact that Genovese spent the last nine years of his life in prison. He tried to keep things going from his cell but was also interred with Vincent Giangrande, a recent associate of his, to solicit his assistance in the murder of Costello, the very man connected to Genovese through a cocaine charge in 1958. Indeed, he was imprisoned in Atlanta along with several other associates, including Joseph Valaki, who the Genoveses had hired to kill Stephen Franca, the man who had been watching over his wife, Anna, while Genovese was in Italy. For various motives, the socio-cultural construct of the Genovese people, amongst others, had many reservations against Valaki. In Atlanta, who developed a vague fear of being murdered, turned state evidence in 1962 following another criminal charge. When Genovese was summoned before the same hearings in 1963, Valachi took the stand and produced some of the most damaging material on the Italian-American mafia that had ever been presented in court. Five years later still, Genovese had been summoned originally for a hearing with the McCarthy Committee. Valachi was an archival historian on the history of Cosa Nostra and its development as far back as the 1920s, which was easy to understand since he had firsthand witnessed everything as it happened, all the way back to Prohibition, for he was alongside Salvatore Maranzano in the Castile Wars in the early 1930s. Valachi claimed that Genovese, as it was understood within the family, was the most powerful figure in the family structure and had command over three branches of Cosa Nostra operating from Atlanta. He had no knowledge, however, that circumstances had changed. By that point, the authorities in charge in Atlanta had decided to remove Vito from his position and relocate him to a penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, in order to prevent him from engaging in any more policies of imperialism, which they found intolerable, while he willingly carved out an enclave for himself in the prison. They virtually barred him from conducting business in this region. Following the release of Eugene Giangrande, who was let out of jail earlier, in 
he and some other associates gradually, in a non-official manner, took over leadership of the Genovese crime family in New York from the mid-1960s. Gregory Genovese was an aged, sickly, and unkempt man in Kansas with a history of bladder cancer, heart problems, and respiratory failure. It had been his habit to smoke since childhood, and it was reported in 1967 that he was already more than 70 years old. By the end of January 1969, he could barely walk unless he was able to catch his breath. Due to his transfer to a prison hospital in Springfield, Missouri, little could be done to ease his suffering, and he died early on February 14, 1969, from a second thromboembolism. Predictably, as anticipated by police and the press, the funeral of the man who wished to become the do-all, be-all saw, over a hundred people gather, and probably even fewer would have come had it not been for the crowds of pupils from the school where Vito's daughter Nancy worked, who came along. Following his death, they kept him in a family grave in Queens without much fanfare, quite notably, although he could not possibly have known it, nor could any other man in the Italian Mafia. The era that Vito Genovese's death marked towards the end of the 1960s spelled the decline of the so-called golden years of Cosa Nostra in the United States. It was on such a backdrop that organized crime became a political and law enforcement threat, as the fear of the organized syndicate's strength grew with its domination over the unions. The construction sector, several utilities, Las Vegas, and drug trafficking in several states. This was particularly the case after Valachi appeared before the Senate in 1963. By the 1970s, cities such as New York City, Chicago, Kansas City, and Las Vegas were using up large resources against the Mafia. These investments were recovered in the 1980s when the casinos and hotels of Las Vegas started to get rid of the mob influence. Meanwhile, with the changes in laws on drug offenses, where stiffer punishments were imposed on drug traffickers and dealers, more ex-mafias turned witnesses to escape long jail sentences. John Gotti, the famous boss of the Gambino crime family in New York, became infamous in the 1980s for being termed the Teflon Don, signifying that each time he was arrested and put on trial, he managed to be set free. However, even he was convicted of murder in 1992 and sentenced to life imprisonment. This situation has drastically changed with the Mafia still present in America, but its presence and power are now at their lowest point than they have ever been. To some extent, Vito Genovese can be said to have contributed to the decline of the Mafia in the 70s and the 80s. He became visible in the 1920s, alongside other neophyte Italian mobsters, when he relocated to New York City during his early years. Some of the most prominent figures in the history of the Italian-American Mafia, including Genovese, Luciano, and Costello, along with their Jewish criminal associates such as Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel, were all part of this second wave of Mafia emergence in the Big Apple. From the very beginning, the Mafia was influenced and shaped by Prohibition. It was primarily a wealthy and uncoordinated syndicate of crime that peaked during the Great Depression and later helped the mob achieve a national scale, controlling a significant part of the American organized criminal economy. However, Genovese turned out to become a lethal figure over time. In contrast to Luciano and Costello, whose calm temper helped them understand why a wider-reaching mafia operated along a decentralized system that attracted the least attention possible, such a viewpoint did not discourage Genovese. After World War II, he returned to America more determined than ever to take on the Mafia. Some years ago, he visited the USA, attempting to fulfill his ambition of becoming the first among equals. The boss of bosses. After that incendiary, Maranzano. In the end, his ambition during the 1950s turned into his undoing and allowed the U.S. authorities to intensify their attacks against the Mafia in a more organized way. What are people's opinions of Vito Genovese? Did his violent and provocative power drive signify the beginning of the Italian-American Mafia's gradual decline? Thanks for watching, but in the meantime, kindly leave comments in the comment section.